so uh, I'm very pleased to uh, to be able to say that I'm talking to uh, Jeremy Merrifield, who's uh, on the line from LA. I think LA, right? I'm assuming that's right. Uh, who is the director of Balloon, which won the special jury prize at the uh, Young Director Awards this year, uh, 2020. So, Jeremy, thanks for taking the time. It's great to to meet you and to talk to you. Um, and look, before we jump into talking specifically about your film. Uh, I just wanted to ask what your sort of background was. How did you get into directing? What in sort of inspired you to become a director? Sure. Uh, yeah. Um, I uh, started off as an actor in the theater in New York City. Um, uh, and um, I knew I eventually wanted to direct, but I thought before I, before I got that bossy, I should uh, go uh, learn some things. So I, I, I started with acting and I tried to take as many different jobs as I could working um, in the theater, on in film sets and advertising. Um, just sort of get a real rounded ed like miseducation in um, in uh, storytelling. Okay. So yeah. Okay. So you say so you acted as well. So that's your sort of introduction, was it? Okay. But you're, you're not. Yeah, yeah. You're not in this film though. You decided to sort of uh, move away from. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No. I. I it's definitely best uh, not to be in front of the camera when you're behind it. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so I really try to avoid that when I can. <laughs> okay. So uh, Balloon, uh, fantastic film, uh, and you both directed and wrote uh, a film. So can you tell us a little bit about the inspiration behind that? What sort of led you to want to make a film and write a film? Firstly, um, uh, like like the one that you did. Sure. Yeah. Balloon came. Balloon came at a moment in, like, I think, in the world, and then also personally for me. I, uh, my nephew, um, he had just entered middle school. Uh, you know, uh, it's like the seventh, eighth grade uh, in the states, and he, um, you know, he was this real light of a kid, this big, bright smile, and he was so creative and like quick witted and funny. And you could kind of see this light sort of like start to dim, like he started, he started to grit his jaw and like get a little more serious and like, you know, deciding what was manly and like how I was going to handle something. And, um, and it was, it was kind of, it was kind of not only sad to see, but it was also triggering. Like I remembered my own experience. I remember my brothers growing up and uh, at the same time, Harvey Weinstein was in the news and Bill Cosby was in the news. and. Um, our president was saying things about women the way he was talking about, you know, I mean, there, there, there are, there were head, there was headline after headline of uh, men that, uh, exhibiting toxically masculine behavior. Mm -hmm. And so I, I thought, how does a boy like my nephew, not to say he would, but that how, do, I think all toxic, you know, headlines started off with a cute kid. Like, you know, like where did the things go wrong? Like where did they ended up? How did they end up? you know, a, a committing sexual assault or cheating at the Super Bowl or whatever. So our our story was designed to explore just a moment in a, a, a sort of a, a test in a kid's life and how he was going to handle it, uh, how he would try to find out what was right and what was wrong. And also we, we did it in the superhero genre because we kind of felt like superheroes were this, there was like this sort of rabid love of superheroes. And it was like, they were the only real role models young men had, and they're not even real. Yeah. They don't even exist. So yeah. it's, um, it, we thought that was a really good way to like take the genre and like really question why we all love the genre in the first place. Like yeah. what are we teaching our boys by punching through their problems? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. It was interesting, like the superhero element to it was really interesting, I thought. And, you know, as I was watching it, I was asking myself like, are these powers real? You know, are they kind of actual things and this is happening in the film and it's a realistic, not realistic, but you know what I mean? Like it's actually happening uh, as yeah. we or is, is this just a manifestation of his sort of hopes and dreams and the way that he's acting and stuff? So, I mean, that felt sort of ambiguous to me because I didn't know at the end whether that was kind of, he was, he did have those powers or whether or not it's just something that he was imagining and kind of living through. Did, did you leave it purposely ambiguous? Or, or do you, to yeah. you, is that a real, is it, you know, he's got superpowers and that's how it is. Yeah. I mean, I feel like I kind of had like two parts of me. I had my own interpretation, but then I really, really wanted to be able to create an interpretive story. Um, I was listening to Charlie Kaufman talk about, um, I'm thinking of ending things just recently. And he, he, he really wanted people to experience that film 
how are they experienced? And every, every interpretation is legitimate. And I've, that's really what we set out to do with this too, is like we really wanted uh, there to be a version of it where people might really just watch the, a really great superhero movie. And yeah. then I think if you wanna dig into more than that and find out different interpretations, and I've heard some great things that we never even intended. I just was, I, I, I think that's great. I, I think we were really trying to never get never crystallized the interpretation. We just wanted to make sure when we were, when we were bringing the audience with us that they would leave uh, with a conversation. And, I, and, I, and the conversations we've been able to have after the film, I think have done that. And as we started to share it with young people and to, you know, nonprofit organizations who deal with, you know, not only bullying, but um, any toxic behavior really, I think uh, it's been really encouraging, so yeah. Okay, and one of the, Kind of scary elements I found of it was as kind of at the beginning where the, the the kids are going through the the sort of scenario of what if a shooter came in the school, uh, and, and personally as a non US resident, I mean I know that these things happened, but the fact that that you know I've heard about those things before, but just kind of seeing it you know put on screen made it quite a sort of made me think and maybe sort of it jolted me. Did was that a purposely part of the film and also because it obviously added to the kind of claustrophobic atmosphere as well but did yeah you about that about shocking people because of that particular element yeah for sure i mean you know i think part of this conversation about toxic masculinity which isn't even a term that i really love because i also don't want to tell boys just because they're masculine that, that it's toxic i think we're right. really we're really saying this is an extreme hyper if you let masculinity go completely unbalanced and unbridled it becomes a hyper masculinity that can be damaging mm -hmm. but um I think uh, I've, the thing that we, in all the research, I did tons of interviews and research, and I, the thing that I came up with is that every time a gun comes into the classroom, it's a boy, it's not a girl. And what, we're, what they're doing is they're bringing this, this, this object, this sort of avatar of power with them. And um, to sort of have power, to feel in power, to, to feel control. And um, so we felt like that was a really sort of like a good centerpiece to really start with our theme. Yeah. Um, and it's also just, I mean, it's also really ridiculous. It's just ridiculous. So we really had, we had a great comic actor come in and play the officer, uh, Paul Shear. Yeah. And I think it really, and he said things that are like real lines from real, you know, real uh, active shooter training drills. And when he says them, you realize how hilarious they are. I mean, darkly hilarious, but like I mean, hopelessly hilarious. Yeah. But it, it sort of just brings about the absurdity of it. And I think that was really important to us that we like, just like, let's just, well, first things first, look how absurd this is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it was a really good scene and it kind of drew you into the scenario. And, and you want to talk about the actor as well. Um, is it Jonah Beres? Is, you, is that how you pronounce it? That's correct, well, yeah. He, he was great. I mean, he was, he was amazing, kind of, you know, captivating and played that part really well. How did you... How did you find him and how did you know that he was your Sam Wheeler when, when, you, um, when you were looking, at, uh, looking for him? Sure, yeah. Uh, we, we got really lucky early on to bring on a great casting director, uh, Debbie Romano. Emmy nominated casting director of this, that 70s show. She found that cast originally. She's done amazing work and she really liked the scripts. She came on and championed us from the very beginning and brought us in great talent. And, that is really how we found Jonah. Um, I always say we knew him when he's now is on that Hulu show, Pen Fifteen, and I think he's going to blow up huge. He's really, really talented kid. He just has this ability that when all of the crazy things that are happening on the set happen, um, he can't fake it. He's going to just be really honest. And you know, when you, you what you want out of an actor is you don't want somebody who's a professional faker. You want somebody who's just going to be doing it. Like, it's like I, we say action and then the scene is you're going to talk to your friend and he just talks to him. And I think that that hopeless authenticity is like just the really good stuff of film actors. And I think that's what he has. So. Yeah, he's brilliant. I mean, they're all brilliant. Uh, the, the bully as well, you know, the guy that he's sort of immediately dislikable. <laughs> so yeah, kind of like, has like a like a Draco Malfoy a little bit <laughs> yeah. going on for him. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he was very yeah. part very well. They all did. They all did. And of course, he's like the sweetest kid ever, and, and he just pulls that off for that yeah. role. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, what for you? What was the most challenging part of the whole project? What was the bit that sort of uh, that, that challenged you the most? 
I think the, 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 the biggest challenge is also one of the things that I love, which is that um, we had no money and we, we had very little money and we wanted to make that little bit of money look like a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so we kind of crafted things around assets that we knew we had. Um, you know, I have some rough visual effects skills myself and then I knew some visual effects people. So we kind of, we kind of talked about the shots and we planned a lot. We had a lot, I mean, every, I've, I'd storyboarded almost every frame of the movie because I just wanted to make sure, not to say that we wouldn't throw them out on set. I just wanted to make sure every part of, every product, uh, every department was super prepared and taken care of. Um, that's sort of like my commercial background a little bit there to, to storyboard everything. But it really, it wasn't designed to micromanage so much as it was designed to make sure everyone knew what we were doing and they had the opportunity early on to sort of riff and improv and bring their own creativity to this to the to the um to the table but that way once we were on set and we only had six days to shoot the entire superhero movie right. i mean it's 16 yeah. minutes but it's you know it's it's a pretty beefy 16 minutes um we really needed to all be very prepared that this is like uh, this is how this setup would look like this is what this would look like and the, all the parts would move very quickly mm. um so yeah yeah, it's great. I mean, it sort of as well feels a bit like an origin story. Do you know what I mean? Like, a, you know, like a classic superhero origin story. So do, do you think, I mean, is there, do you have plans to kind of explore that world or that character further? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it, it is an origin story. And I think what the origin story that we really set out to, and this is something we were always saying when we were talking about the story was like, let's create a superhero, but let's, let's make one that's, aspirational one that will make mistakes but yeah. his moral compass is in the right direction and that is that is aspiring to that that is that is inspiring um and so um what as we explored the concept we actually built a feature film out of it so we have a feature script that we're right um we're, we're gonna we're gonna make that that film next um uh so as our proof of concept, we did balloon. So that's how that kind of came to be. Oh, that's exciting. So when yeah. how far down the line are you with that? Well, who knows? I, yeah. I, I thought we were much closer and then the world went upside down. Oh yeah, of course. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, but I'm hoping we'll be able to, we'll be able to pick that up within this year or, or, or uh, top of next year and yeah. be able to shoot it next year. Amazing, amazing. And yeah. then, you know, look, the, the film is amazing. It's engaging and, uh, you know, interesting and, and emotional. But it's, uh, and you've got lots of plaudits for it. But what's it like to win awards and a YDA specifically? What does that sort of mean to you uh, to sort of come away with, you know, peers and, and people that work in the industry sort of lauding your work? Well, I mean, first of all, thank you for watching it. Like to me, like I'm so grateful when somebody watched a short film that I made because I think short films are just so hard to get people to watch. There's such a saturated market that doesn't even really have a place to be a market. Yeah. So when you make a short film, it's always a huge risk. So I'm always really happy when somebody even watched it and is willing to talk to me about it. Like <laughs> you, you watched this thing we made. Uh, I, I think to, uh, when you win the awards, um, you know, I'm, you're so thankful. Validation feels good, but of course, validation is a little bit like a like a an addiction or a drug. You, so you try to have to like kind of like put yourself in your in 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 the corner and be like, no, no, you, this, it's it's it, it's good. But ne next thing, keep making, keep keep creating. Um, but it's good, and I think the best thing about an uh, an award really is is that um, you know we make movies to make more movies and an award helps you make the next movie so i'm so thankful for that aspect of it yeah yeah well i mean i would uh, urge anyone watching this i mean hopefully the film uh, will be on the page wherever this uh, interview uh, uh, initially, uh, eventually lives it's a fantastic film it, it, from the moment i started watching it it's one of those things that you just kind of you know you're gripped by because it's such so, so well acted and directed and, and it's just a great story so congratulations well deserved win at the YDA um and I look forward to seeing the hopefully the, the sort of extended version of that in the in the coming sort of uh, in the coming while when you when the world sort of reopens itself hopefully when we can make movies again exactly <laughs> it's, it's starting to happen it's starting <laughs> yeah. yeah but for, uh, Jeremy thank you so much for taking the time to talk congratulations on the win on the film and uh, and the best of luck with uh, everything you do in the future. Thank you so much, Danny. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. Not at all.